eternal myth. Greek poets sang of a fantastic age before recorded time, an age of gods and heroes, of monsters and epic wars. Until our own century, it was believed that these were merely fables. A brilliant Englishman named Arthur Evans would show us the songs of the poets held a deeper truth. He would discover the Minoans, a dazzling civilization lost in time, builders of the mythic labyrinth, even the nation of lost Atlantis. Atlantis, mystery of the Minoans. Late in the 19th century, historians maintain that the glory of classical Greece burst like a brilliant sun from prehistoric darkness. There is no evidence that any Western civilization preceded the rise of the Greeks 800 years before Christ. Arthur Evans will spend a lifetime pushing back the boundaries of history. Arthur Evans is born in 1851, an era of scientific revolution. His father, John, is a millionaire and pioneer archaeologist. The work of John Evans pushes the dawn of human civilization farther and farther back in time, a concept rejected by the Oxford academic elite. Now young Arthur Evans enters the fray. By the time he is 30, he has made his mark as a scholar and a rather wild adventurer. In 1882, the wandering Evans serves time in a Bosnian jail for supporting radicals trying to overthrow Austrian rule. Compared to such escapades, Oxford life bores him. He is anxious to set out on another great adventure, and recent discoveries in Greece give him the excuse he needs. The cause for Evans' excitement? Incredible finds made by a German named Heinrich Schliemann. Schliemann has followed a trail nearly 3,000 years old. The trail of Homer, the great blind bard, whose masterwork was the Western world's first war story. The Iliad, the chronicle of the bloody Greek assault on the city-state of Troy to rescue the beautiful Helen. A desperate mission that turned to victory when the Greeks tricked the Trojans, entering the city hidden in a giant wooden horse. In 1873, Heinrich Schliemann, the Iliad in one hand and a shovel in the other, announces that he has found the ruins of ancient Troy in modern Turkey. Buried beneath millennia of rubble, the German uncovers a great ancient city he believes can only be Troy. And as Schliemann's wife models a priceless headdress found in the ruins, he proclaims Helen of Troy reborn. A Troy myth has been made real, but now Arthur Evans is heading for Schliemann's latest and most spectacular find, Mycenae, the mystic city of the glory of the Greeks. To Homer, Mycenae was the citadel of the great King Agamemnon, leader of the Greek assault on Troy, a fortress whose massive brooding walls have been set in place by the giant Cyclops. Here again, the words of Homer lead Schliemann to astounding discoveries. Tombs worthy of ancient nobles, the swords of Agamemnon's army, the gold of the royal court, and, Schliemann believes, the golden death mask of Agamemnon himself, a mighty king, according to legend, murdered by his own wife. Arthur Evans is obsessed by the riddle of Mycenae. 
Once it had been a bastion of wealth, power, and artistry. But then, suddenly, Mycenae crumbled, doomed to survive only in the lyric lines of Homer. A fortress on Greek soil, yet so different from classical Greece. He wonders, who lived here? Evans is convinced a people advanced enough to construct this great city must have been literate. Throughout what is now the civilized European area, there must have once existed systems of picture writing such as still survive among the more primitive races of mankind. It is the destiny of Arthur Evans to unravel the mystery. In Athens, after meeting with Schliemann at his home, questions race through Evans' mind. Among the artifacts from Mycenae, there is one that puzzles him, an ancient ring decorated with the image of an octopus. Why would the landlocked Mycenaeans use the octopus as an emblem? Evans speculates, was Mycenae merely one outpost of the ancient Mediterranean world? Evans has one clue. Now he hunts for more. Year after year, he travels to Greece, searching for traces of a culture more ancient than the builders of the Acropolis. In 1892, he writes to his wife, Margaret, in England, of one astonishing find. Yesterday, I was grubbing below the Acropolis and picking out fragments of pre mycenaean vases, which no one here seems to have heeded before. Tantalizing clues that Greece's golden age was preceded by one just as great, but completely lost to modern times. In Greek markets, Evans hunts for more pre-classical artifacts. He finds tiny engraved stones, similar in workmanship to the octopus ring from Mycenae. When he asks, where these stones come from, not Mycenae, not the Greek mainland, but an obscure island 200 miles away, Crete. Crete, a magical, legendary island. Its unmatched beauty and its mighty king described in the works of Homer. In the middle of the wine-dark sea, there is an isle called Crete, a ravager of eyes, washed by the sea. On Crete are many cities. The greatest is Knossos, where King Minos ruled, in council with mighty Zeus. According to myth, Zeus, king of gods, disguised himself as a bull and ravished the mortal Europa. Europa gave birth to three sons. One of them was Minos, destined to rule the seas with the world's first navy. Like the signet stones, the myth of Minos leads Arthur Evans south. On Crete, he will arrive at the intersection of myth and reality. He will enter the fantastic realm of Minos. In March 1894, the English adventurer Arthur Evans arrives on the island of Crete, drawn by an obsession with the ancient world that will haunt him for the rest of his life.
Crete is a backwater, torn apart by the conflict between the ruling Muslims and a Christian majority. On the surface, little evidence of the island's lost glory. Evans finds what he came looking for, more of the engraved stones he had seen in the Athens marketplace, ancient gems worn by village women as lucky maternal charms. The engraved gems show that there was here a considerable perfection in art, and excavation may bring untold treasures to light. The golden age of Crete lies far beyond the limits of the historical period. Evans turns from adventure to archaeology, guided like Schliemann by Homer. His quest draws him to a grassy plain where, according to legend, there once stood a palace called Knossos. At Knossos itself, it was well known that there was an ancient site and an, an important one. And the name Knossos is well known from mythology. Uh, as one of the important cities, the most important city of Crete itself. So he arrived here with the intention of acquiring the land on the ancient site. Beneath this meadow, perhaps, lay the mythical lair of the ferocious Minotaur, half man, half bull, the bestial offspring of Minos's wife, Pasitha. Such was the might of Minos that he could demand from Athens bloody tribute to the creature. Seven young men, seven young maidens, torn apart to appease the wrath of King Minos. Until brave Theseus entered the labyrinth and killed the beast within. Evans yearns to excavate the site of this gory history but the only way to secure permission is to purchase the land from its owner. The haggling will take six long years. A frustrating time made even more torturous for Evans by the death of his wife. I don't think anyone can ever know what Margaret has been to me. All seems very dark and without consolation. In 1897, another blow. The people of Crete face a harsh civil war. On the threshold of a great discovery, Arthur Evans must return to England and wait. When the fighting ends, Crete is independent. Excavation is permitted, and the real estate bargaining finally continues. To his almost inexhaustible powers of obstruction, I can pay the highest tribute. However, after encountering obstacles and delays of every kind, I was able at the beginning of 1900 to purchase the whole. To help with the excavation, Evans summons a respected archaeologist. Could you come supervise, under my direction, important excavation, Knossos? Personal affair terms, four months, 60 pounds, and all expenses paid. To begin at once, Evans. Duncan Mackenzie will supervise the digging, beginning a partnership with Arthur Evans that will last for 30 years. To preserve harmony on the fractious island, Evans insists that his work crew contain both Christian and Muslim laborers. The work at Knossos signals the future cooperation of the two creeds under the new regime on the island. 
A few months earlier, both parties had been shooting each other on sight. March 23rd, 1900. The ground of Crete is finally broken. And within days, the new century is crowned with a legend brought spectacularly to life. At the age of 49, after decades of study and searching, Arthur Evans has found a lost civilization older than classical Greece, older than mysterious Mycenae. The extraordinary phenomenon, nothing Greek, nothing Roman. Nay, its great age goes well back to the pre-Mycenaean period. On April 5th, after only two weeks of work, Arthur Evans becomes the first man in three and a half thousand years to gaze upon the face of an ancient son of Crete. Not Greek, not Mycenaean. What then? For 20 years, the English scholar Arthur Evans has searched for the historical origin of Greek myth. Now, on the island of Crete, he finds it. Walls and floors, pottery of an unknown style, the works of a mysterious civilization to be scrupulously examined by Duncan Mackenzie. Evans was extremely lucky when Mackenzie came with him to Knossos, because I don't think Evans really had a great deal of knowledge about the practicalities of field excavation and how one has to excavate carefully layer by layer in order to determine the chronology of what one is digging. And so uh, Mackenzie's contribution to the excavations here at Knossos was absolutely crucial. Mackenzie concludes that Knossos is nearly 5,000 years old and that a great dynasty ruled this land until around 1400 BC, then vanished. Evans names this lost world Minoan, after the legendary ruler of Crete, King Minos. He has discovered the royal palace of a forgotten empire. On April 13th, 1900, the workers uncover this elegant chamber at the heart of the royal palace. To Evans, the throne room of King Minos the oldest throne in Europe. Evans imagines the palace in all its glory. Evans will spend the rest of his life in the pursuit and the resurrection of the glory of the Minoan world. Frescoes show a society of graceful noble women at leisure. Of daring young men vaulting over the horns of mighty bulls. In these vivid paintings, Evan sees the legendary combat of Theseus and the Minotaur brought to life. Throughout the palace, images of the sacred bull, symbol of virility and power, echoes of timeless myths. Myths of bulls and of the goddess of the snakes, a palace consecrated to faith and ritual. Evans, I think, was correct to see ritual almost everywhere, and it's something which goes hand in hand with daily life, and if we can understand that, then we're halfway to understanding what my own life was really all about. But Knossos was more than the temple of Manoan religion. It was their capital, command center of a great trading empire with links in Europe, Africa, and Asia. Evans finds huge warehouses of jars that once were filled with grain, honey, oil, and wine, thousands of gallons at a time. 
he wonders if these great sunken chambers also had a more ominous function. With what object were these walled pits constructed? It does not seem unreasonable to recognize in these deep sunk wall chambers the dungeons of the palace. The longer chamber holding several prisoners, the smaller perhaps for solitary confinement. The groans of these Minoan dungeons may well have found an echo in the tale of Theseus. The sheer scale of Knossos is overwhelming. 1,400 rooms, far bigger than Buckingham Palace, sprawling over six acres. The Minoans even had running water and a system of sewage drains 1,500 years older than the famous Roman aqueducts. An engineering marvel of the ancient world. Conveniences not even enjoyed by some of Evans' English countrymen in 1900. In one room, Evans believes he has found the bathing chamber of the queen herself. Again, he is transported through time to an elegant room of comfort and grace. But to the Englishman, the most precious of the gifts of ancient Knossos is not its architecture. It is a series of tablets impressed with an unknown hieroglyphic text. We have found a kind of baked clay bar, rather like a stone chisel in shape, though broken at one end with script on it and what appear to be numerals. I must have about 700 pieces by now. It's extremely satisfactory, as it's what I came to Crete to find. Evans identifies two types of script, which he calls Linear A and Linear B. But to read them, Arthur Evans will have to break their fascinating code. More and more, Evans is convinced that Knossos, not Mycenae, was the civilization that presaged classical Greece, a capital without defensive walls, a center of culture, comfort, and peace, entered by the oldest road in Europe. Then, the Minoans vanished. Their majestic palaces crumbled. Why? To find out, to fully excavate and study the ruins of Knossos, Arthur Evans will devote all his life and nearly all his vast fortune, hiring first 50 men, then 250. In May 1901, Evans' laborers unearth one of the most marvelous relics of Knossos. Giant stone blocks that Evans realizes must have been part of a grand staircase. For four years, with intense effort, the men worked to re-erect the stairway. Four stories high, the greatest architectural wonder of the Minoan world. Evans is convinced he has brought back to life the oldest and most brilliant civilization of the Western world. Crete, this comparatively small island left on one side today by all the main lanes of Mediterranean intercourse, was once the starting point and the earliest stage on the highway of European civilization. But if the Minoans were so mighty, why did their empire crumble? The answer may lie in another myth, a myth of beauty and terror. The Minoan world, unknown until the turn of the 20th century, has been unearthed on the island of Crete. In 1908, their discoverer, Arthur Evans, builds himself a grand new home at the site of Royal Knossos. He calls it the Villa Ariadne, 
named after the legendary daughter of King Minos. The labyrinth of her monstrous brother, the Minotaur, is now completely revealed. There can be little remaining doubt that this huge building with its maze of corridors and tortuous passages, its medley of small chambers, its long succession of magazines with their blind endings, was in fact the labyrinth for the Minotaur of grisly fame. Here too begins the myth of Daedalus, master architect of Knossos, cast into the labyrinth by Minos with his son Icarus, but not for long as the legend tells us. Daedalus fashioned wings from feathers and wax. He warned his son, do not fly too high or the sun will melt the wings. Icarus did not listen. Exhilarated, he soared higher and higher he fell to the sea and drowned. Evan's discoveries amaze the world. He has found the solid stone basis of the most alluring of ancient myths. But unknown to Evans, there is another legend to be tested at Knossos. Arthur Evans has brought a forgotten civilization back to life, but it is the Minoan writing that obsesses him. He will puzzle over this lost language for the rest of his life, but the tablets will never surrender their secrets to him. And he himself is about to be separated from his beloved Knossos for nearly 10 years. In the summer of 1914, gunfire in the streets of Sarajevo. An Austrian archduke is dead. And soon the Balkans, then all of Europe and the Mediterranean, are engulfed in the First World War. Further excavation on Crete is impossible. Evans waits out the war in England. At its end, he negotiates on behalf of the fractious Balkan states and helps create a new country, Yugoslavia. The world is once again a peaceful place. Only then, in 1922, can he return to the land of Minos. By now, Sir Arthur Evans is in his 70s, knighted for his discoveries on the island of Crete. But the work of Sir Arthur is far from over. He embarks on one of the most controversial projects in the history of archaeology, fulfilling a dream to not only uncover ancient Knossos, but to reconstruct it as he imagines its golden age. Duncan Mackenzie is assigned to oversee the restoration. He spent a great deal of time thinking about restoration, but this was only carried out in stages. In a sense, it was rather tentative at the beginning, partly because he wanted to know more about how it should be restored, but also because he really had to wait until reinforced concrete came into, um, into use in the 1920s, and it was then that he went rather wild over the restoration. The Palace of Minos is to be recreated according to Evans' vision of the ancient Minoan world. The project is daring and controversial, but Evans owns Knossos. He is respected enough and rich enough to endure the criticism, working sometimes from the archaeological evidence, sometimes from his own imagination, he wants visitors to see Knossos as it was, millennia ago. Ancient Knossos has been returned to the sunlight a city that once ruled the Mediterranean, then vanished. But why? 
1926, Evans believes he has found the answer. When a powerful earthquake rocks the island, he senses the fury of the ancient Minoan sacred idol. A dull sound rose from the ground like the muffled roar of an angry bull. It is something to have heard with one's own ears the bellowing of the bull beneath the earth. Restoration survived the quake, and Evans is convinced a similar cataclysm must have destroyed Knossos in 1400 BC. For Evans, one mystery has been solved, but the other, the Minoan tablets, still escapes him. After 30 years of struggling, Arthur Evans has not been able to hear the voices of the silent past. Sir Arthur has resurrected the grandeur of a lost world. One night, ill and feverish, he descends the grand staircase and is immersed in a final magical vision of the gentle race he rescued from eternity. as well. The whole place seemed to wait to life and movement. Such was the force of the illusion of the priest king with his plumed crown, great ladies tightly girdled, flounced and corseted, long stone priests and after them a retinue of elegant and sinewy youths, as if the cupbearer and his fellows had stepped down from the walls, passed and repassed on the flights below. In 1935, Evans leaves Crete for the last time, bidding farewell to Knossos. His life's work is complete. Sir Arthur dies six years later, defiant, controversial, indomitable to the last. Evans had taken scraps of pottery and shreds of myth and uncovered a regal empire. But one secret, the secret of the empire's collapse, remains embedded in the most alluring legend of all, the fable of lost Atlantis. English archaeologist Sir Arthur Evans labored to find the historical truths behind Greek myth. Two questions about the Minoans remained unanswered, their language and their demise. After Evans' death, a Greek archaeologist named Spiridon Marinatos picks up the trail. Marinatos gets his first clue in 1932. He digs at a site called Amnisos on the north coast of Crete a town described by the blind poet Homer as the port of royal Knossos. We're at the site of Amnisos, on the, in the center of the north coast of Crete, uh, where Marinatos excavated this marvelous Minoan villa, which has been nicknamed the Villa of the Lilies after the frescoes which were found uh, inside the villa. At one part of the site, he found great cut blocks which had been shifted out of place, which he attributed to a tsunami. Uh, or tidal wave. 
All around here, one finds pieces of pumice, which are clearly from this Minoan eruption itself. And even on top of this hill here, we today have found pieces of pumice, which surely can only have got here with a tsunami or tidal wave. have set off such a deadly wave? The answer dawns on Marinatos, 75 miles north of Crete, an island called Santorini, an island that was rocked by an ancient cataclysm hundreds of times more powerful than a hydrogen bomb. Santorini. A stark volcanic landscape whose sheer cliffs are all that remain after a fiery catastrophe that ripped out the heart of the island. Marinatos is convinced. The catastrophe that obliterated the Minoan world is the same one described in the most famous of all Greek legends, the lost continent of Atlantis, recorded by the greatest of all philosophers, Plato. In this island of Atlantis had arisen a great and wonderful monarchy, which ruled the whole island as well as many others and parts of the mainland. But afterwards came a time of earthquakes and disasters. In one terrible day and night, Atlantis sank into the sea and vanished. Plato chronicled the myth of Atlantis in 300 BC, 400 years after Homer's Iliad, a thousand years after the end of the great Minoan Empire. Was Plato writing a fable or transcribing history? Marinatos believes the legend is a distorted memory of the destruction which befell Crete and Santorini. Atlantis, as described by Plato, bears an uncanny similarity to the Minoan world discovered by Arthur Evans on Crete. Plato repeatedly describes the Atlanteans' obsession with the mighty bull. In the sanctuary of the city, bulls roamed at large. The princes hunted them with wooden staves and ropes, but with no weapons of iron. When the bull was captured, they brought him to a column and slew him over it, drenching the inscription with his blood. Plato describes the geography of the island, again resembling Crete. The whole country was said to be surrounded by mountains which descended toward the sea. The mountains were celebrated for their beauty. Marinatos believes the Minoans were the people of Atlantis. He's convinced a great secret lies waiting to be discovered on Santorini. Thirty years will pass before he can test his theory. In 1941, Hitler's Blitzkrieg reaches the shores of Crete. Hundreds of patriots are killed. Arthur Evans' home, the Villa Ariadne, is commandeered as Nazi headquarters. Then, at war's end, a bloody revolution in Greece renders field work impossible. Not until 1967 can Marinatos finally dig on Santorini. The site is a barren field and a low-lying part of the island that might have escaped the worst of the eruption. Almost immediately, Marinatos workers discover structures that are unmistakably Minoan. Pots painted in Minoan style, sealed intact in volcanic ash for more than 3,000 years.
The Minoan houses of Santorini are virtually intact, some of them two stories tall. Frescoes have been perfectly preserved, vivid with the artistry of a vanished people. Among the most famous, the fishing boy. Unlike the wall paintings of courtly life at Royal Knossos, the frescoes of Santorini celebrate the lives of a merchant class, as described in Plato's Atlantis. The charming art of this ancient village reflects the dreams of a people tied to the sea, a nation of sailors and traders again matching Plato's account of the seafaring Atlanteans. Their ships touch the shores of Egypt, Libya, Mesopotamia. Scenes of pastoral tranquility, of commerce and combat. A gentle life suddenly shattered by the most destructive volcanic eruption in recorded history. Explosion so powerful that it blew a 32 square mile wide crater out of the center of the island. So fearsome that rock and ash were blasted hundreds of miles away. Sixty miles to the south on Crete, Minoan ports were washed away by tidal waves. Inland, ash rained down on Knossos. Crops failed. Trade ceased. The empire was staggered. excavated by Marinatos escaped before the deadly cataclysm. No skeletons are found, but archaeologists believe that elsewhere on Santorini, other Minoan towns lie sealed in volcanic ash. Somewhere, the bones of Santorini's Minoan victims remain to be found, huddled together in terror as their world blew apart. Marinatos continues to dig on Santorini until 1974, when he dies at the site. He is buried in an ancient Minoan house, laying to rest in lost Atlantis. But on Santorini, he leaves a mystery big enough to keep other archaeologists busy for many years to come. On the shores of the eternal Mediterranean, mighty civilizations rose and fell, conquered, then disappeared. They left their artistry to delight us and their myths to haunt our dreams. The stones of ancient monuments are the proof of the poet's songs, but each new discovery opens the vault of further mystery. And one of the greatest mysteries of all the silent tablets of the great Minoan age will find their voice in the curiosity of a 14-year-old boy. For decades, the English scholar Arthur Evans attempted to decipher two forms of written script from the palace of Knossos on the island of Crete. He never succeeded. But in 1936, when he was 85 years old, Evans lectured to an audience of school children on the undeciphered Minoan scripts he called Linear A and Linear B. In the audience was a 14-year-old boy named Michael Ventris, who decided then and there that he would be the one to break the code. It takes him 16 years, but he succeeds. He deciphers Linear B. During the last few weeks, I've suddenly come to the conclusion that the Knossos and Pinos tablets must, after all, be written in Greek. A difficult and archaic Greek, seeing that it's 500 years older than Homer, and written in a rather abbreviated form. 
but Greek nevertheless. Ventris has pushed back the dawn of the West by a thousand years. The names on the Linear B tablets are those of Greek legends. Hector, Achilles, Poseidon, Zeus. Proof that Western culture did not begin with the Acropolis, with Homer or Plato. It began with the Minoans. Tragically, Michael Ventris dies in an automobile accident in 1956 before he is able to decode the even older script, Linear A. That language remains undeciphered today. A puzzle passed down through 4,000 years, reason, an eternal myth. Greek poets sang of a fantastic age before recorded time, an age of gods and heroes, of monsters and epic wars. Until our own century, it was believed that these were merely fables. A brilliant Englishman named Arthur Evans would show us the songs of the poets held a deeper truth. He would discover the Minoans, a dazzling civilization lost in time, builders of the mythic labyrinth, even the nation of lost Atlantis. Atlantis, mystery of the Minoans. Late in the 19th century, historians maintain that the glory of classical Greece burst like a brilliant sun from prehistoric darkness. There is no evidence that any Western civilization preceded the rise of the Greeks 800 years before Christ. Arthur Evans will spend a lifetime pushing back the boundaries of history. Arthur Evans is born in 1851, an era of scientific revolution. His father, John, is a millionaire and pioneer archaeologist. The work of John Evans pushes the dawn of human civilization farther and farther back in time, a concept rejected by the Oxford academic elite. Now young Arthur Evans enters the fray. By the time he is 30, he has made his mark as a scholar and a rather wild adventurer. In 1882, the wandering Evans serves time in a Bosnian jail for supporting radicals trying to overthrow Austrian rule. Compared to such escapades, Oxford life bores him. He is anxious to set out on another great adventure, and recent discoveries in Greece give him the excuse he needs. The cause for Evans' excitement? Incredible finds made by a German named Heinrich Schliemann. Schliemann has followed a trail nearly 3,000 years old. The trail of Homer, the great blind bard, whose masterwork was the Western world's first war story. The Iliad, the chronicle of the bloody Greek assault on the city-state of Troy to rescue the beautiful Helen. A desperate mission that turned to victory when the Greeks tricked the Trojans, entering the city hidden in a giant wooden horse. In 1873, Heinrich Schliemann, the Iliad in one hand and a shovel in the other, announces that he has found the ruins of ancient Troy in modern Turkey. Buried beneath millennia of rubble, the German uncovers a great ancient city he believes can only be Troy. And as Schliemann's wife models a priceless headdress found in the ruins, he proclaims Helen of Troy reborn. A Troy myth has been made real. But now Arthur Evans is heading for Schliemann's latest and most spectacular find, Mycenae, the mystic city of the glory of the Greeks. To Homer, Mycenae was the citadel of the great king Agamemnon, leader of the Greek assault on Troy, a fortress whose massive brooding walls had been set in place by the giant Cyclops. 
Here again, the words of Homer lead Schliemann to astounding discoveries. Tombs worthy of ancient nobles, the swords of Agamemnon's army, the gold of the royal court, and, Schliemann believes, the golden death mask of Agamemnon himself. A mighty king, according to legend, murdered by his own wife. Arthur Evans is obsessed by the riddle of Mycenae. Once it had been a bastion of wealth, power, and artistry. But then, suddenly, Mycenae crumbled, doomed to survive only in the lyric lines of Homer. A fortress on Greek soil, yet so different from classical Greece. He wonders, who lived here? Evans is convinced a people advanced enough to construct this great city must have been literate. Throughout what is now the civilized European area, there must have once existed systems of picture writing such as still survive among the more primitive races of mankind. It is the destiny of Arthur Evans to unravel the mystery. In Athens, after meeting with Schliemann at his home, questions race through Evans' mind. Among the artifacts from Mycenae, there is one that puzzles him, an ancient ring decorated with the image of an octopus. Why would the landlocked Mycenaeans use the octopus as an emblem? Evans speculates, was Mycenae merely one outpost of the ancient Mediterranean world? Evans has one clue. Now he hunts for more. Year after year, he travels to Greece, searching for traces of a culture more ancient than the builders of the Acropolis. In 1892, he writes to his wife, Margaret, in England, of one astonishing find. Yesterday, I was grubbing below the Acropolis and picking out fragments of pre mycenaean vases, which no one here seems to have heeded before. Tantalizing clues that Greece's golden age was preceded by one just as great, but completely lost to modern times. In Greek markets, Evans hunts for more pre-classical artifacts. He finds tiny engraved stones, similar in workmanship to the octopus ring from Mycenae. When he asks, where these stones come from, not Mycenae, not the Greek mainland, but an obscure island 200 miles away, Crete. Crete, a magical, legendary island. Its unmatched beauty and its mighty king described in the works of Homer. In the middle of the wine-dark sea, there is an isle called Crete, a ravisher of eyes, washed by the sea. On Crete are many cities. The greatest is Knossos, where King Minos ruled, in council with mighty Zeus. According to myth, Zeus, king of gods, disguised himself as a bull and ravished the mortal Europa. Europa gave birth to three sons. One of them was Minos, destined to rule the seas with the world's first navy. 